when I became chief executive, the ministry had fallen on um, hard times, shall we say. Uh, they'd just lost a minister, and then rather untidily also lost a chief executive. Um, so the place was um, in, in free fall. So when I came in, I really had to, I had to rebuild. So it gave me an opportunity from day one um, to do what I, what I really wanted to do, which was to put people at, at the heart of the organisation that I was going to rebuild. First thing um, that I was able to do was to, in a considered manner, um, build an operating model mm -hmm. and the management team that I wanted. What did your awareness of your, your own style as a leader tell you you needed to have around you? So how did you compensate and counter for your own development points? Well, I mean, I'm one of the most extroverted people on the planet, so I knew I didn't need to have a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a person who, is, who tends to be in the future thinking ahead, and so I know that I need people who can keep up with that, but I need people who will tether um, you know, who will uphold mm -hmm. and maintain critical kind of institutions, who will value organisations mm -hmm. uh, and, and so on, value, value if you like, the, the artefacts that have already been collected um, so that they actually are able to survive and continue in, into the new. So when I built a team, I, I looked for people who, who would share my passion, um, who would share the vision, uh, but had those other complementing complementing skills. So when you have an agency in free fall, the temptation is to drive the change from the burning platform, from the negative. And it seems to me, reading your piff, you haven't done that. You've actually had a much more aspirational, ambitious approach to transforming MFE. Yeah, I think, I think the fact the platform was burning was the advantage, because what I was able to do was to pour more petrol on and abandon the platform. Yeah and have a conversation about where we wanted to go as an organisation and who we wanted to be. So it was actually quite empowering because the staff variously were hugely traumatised by the experiences of the previous um, 18 months or so. Um, but the thing that I noticed when I walked into the organisation, and for me it was palpable, is that by and large they were up for it. They knew it couldn't carry on the way it had they knew that as an organisation they were teetering on the edge of oblivion and probably um, if I failed and they lost me, well then they'd lose themselves. So how did you enrol staff in resetting the purpose? I talked a lot about mission, about where I wanted us to be and we came up with a very simple strap line, environmental stewardship for a prosperous New Zealand. And I started talking to people about what I thought stewardship was and what I thought prosperity was. We built an internal dialogue around environment that was very, very different to the conversation that had gone on previously. That was, that was a really important um, device for me. And then driving a conversation with staff around that vision or that mission and how we were then going to deliver it. We, we worked on a, on a strategic direction um, and I was determined that this, this strategic direction would be on a page. I wanted it to be something mm. that people could internalise mm. and that they could see themselves in and they could understand. And uh, we just quite by chance in the design um, process of getting that strategy together, totally turned it around on the page so that instead of having the mission at the top, we actually had it at the bottom. And then we had five behaviours that we wanted people in the organisation to exhibit. And we had those at the top, mm. right? Analyse, engage, learn, validate, collaborate. Mm. And in the conversations that we had with our people, in terms of where we wanted to get to, we talked about the behaviours that we wanted people to exhibit. That was very powerful as we moved to the next stage, which was difficult because we were creating a new operating model, we were doing some very big work to completely reshape the workforce um, and we used those behaviours to drive consideration 
of the sorts of peoples, the sorts of schools, the sorts of attitudes mm -hmm. that we wanted to have in our organisation. So they were built into job descriptions, built into yes, performance agreements and so on. that's right. Yes. So how did you reinforce the desired behaviours? Well, they're all uh, reflected in the performance uh, uh, development system that we have. We have this thing called line of sight. Mm. And everyone in their performance development agreement is expected to write a personal statement at the side of their objectives for the year that describes for them what they are doing to deliver on the mission of the ministry. So we're, we're trying to get this thing we call line of sight so that no matter what job someone is in, they can see themselves in the organisation. So what they're doing is relevant. And the other thing is that they are able to describe um, how they contribute to mission. So we've stuck at that um, absolutely consistently, never ever taking um, you know, the pedal off the metal. What about less formally? You know, performance agreement is one thing, it's a sort of set piece thing mm. and a semi-annual thing, but what about the day-to-day -day celebrations or, or negative de-incentivisation of behaviour? Uh, yeah, I guess there's many things that we, we have done there. A couple of things I think that we've had feedback from staff um, and certainly in, in the engagement journey that we've been on, um, really strong feedback. One is that we have a staff meeting every week. Now we're a small organisation so you can do things, um, but actually these things can be done in large organisations as well, it's just you know the, the methods that you use to do them. But that staff meeting, uh, what we did from day one was that the whole senior team fronted the staff every week. Yeah. Uh, and then what, what I expected the senior team to get up and do was to tell their part of the story. So I'd be saying something and then everyone else would be saying something. Uh, that was quite powerful because they saw a team um, operating and they saw um, a unification of leadership. They also heard the same story through the lenses of the different members of the team. So that it acknowledged, if you like, the differences in the different parts of the organisation, but reinforced the commonality of what we were about to try to do. Mm. Uh, the second thing um, that I did, and I've done it for years now, uh, and that is that uh, we have on all levels of the building, there's a kind of a kitchen and, and kind of tea lunchroom mm. area. Mm. So uh, every week I go to a different floor and I sit in the kitchen and I talk to whatever staff can be bothered turning up to the kitchen for an hour about anything that they want me to talk about and nothing is, is off the table. Um, so I've talked about just about everything uh, with my staff and my organisation over the last five years, um, depending on the different things that we have been going through. Um, and it's astounding actually, um, uh, the feedback that we've got from that because it's actually about me being available um, as, a, as a leader. It's also um, a big thing about being prepared to front up and answer difficult questions. And uh, my staff did not resile from asking me uh, really difficult questions. Um, what do you do when you yeah. don't know the answer? I tell them I don't know the answer. Mm. And I'll find out later. Mm. It sounds like you've thought quite hard about the signs and the symbols, the informal elements of leadership, as well as the formal mm. ones. Yes. Because that's that... <laughs> That comes to the, the, the thorny issue, um, of which many books have been written, um, about authenticity. Mm. Uh, and it, it is a sort of thing uh, that the more people strive to be it, uh, the less they are it. Mm. So people who go off to authenticity school uh, <laughs> generally come back wooden and contrived. Mm. Um, and that's because authenticity requires you to put yourself out there, um, because that's what people that's what people see and respect. Mm. And so, you know, kitchen sessions are about me putting myself out there. Fronting the staff every week is basically about the team putting itself out there and saying, well, here we are. This is how we're doing it. When we did the big change in the organisation, uh, we did a number of things to actually support, in the first instance, the leadership cohort um, that we developed. Um, because after I'd been in the ministry a year, we essentially re populated the whole leadership mm. cohort. Mm. So that gave us an opportunity to do something with all of our managers together. So we developed a bespoke uh, management development program mm -hmm. uh, and basically took them through it. It was an 18 month program uh, to build their skill. 
that program still runs today and is used for the whole natural resources sector uh, managers group. Um, we, we had school deficits in the area of economics. We ran a 26 week internal economics school all right, to lift that particular technical ability um, of, of our staff. So we, when we re-described um, and repopulated the policy function, we put in place the much maligned COBRA, which is just a, just a frame to get people to try to think about policy problems in a coherent way. Um, but importantly, alongside that, if you like, thinking tool, we provided for all of our policy staff um, a description of what they were expected to achieve in their job, the sorts of things that they had to be able to do to be effective, and very importantly, the particular things that we would look at uh, to enable them to be successful and to be promoted. So we gave our people the tools to be successful in their job, and we were very, very clear with them um, about the opportunity that was sitting there for them and what they actually had to do to grab it and move forward. What about the development needs of, of people in terms of poor, poorer performers? Well, there's been a lot of work in parallel, uh, working with our managers, uh, supporting them uh, to give feedback, um, dealing and supporting with them uh, to deal with poor performance. Um, that's happened um, in a number of different ways. I've been pretty direct actually in conversations that I've had with the management cohort. Um, I really remember, um, it'll be about three years ago now, maybe four, three years ago now, uh, the performance um, uh, appraisals had been done and the results came in and um, there was the bell curve, you know, except at MFE it didn't appear to be a bell curve. <laughs> there was this kind of slab um, of exceptional performance and this little kind of thing over here with three people in it in an organisation of 300 um, who weren't meeting expectations. Uh, so unfortunately for my managers that then resulted in, in a lecture about the 2500 year history of the bell curve and how the mathematics was sound, the experiments had been done and the bell curve was a real thing and I expected to see it. Could they please go back and present me with a bell curve? It took me two years but I got one. So the thesis was this is going to be a high performing organisation so our expectations of our staff are universally high. Within that if you like expectation of high performance mm. there are going to be uber high performance mm satisfactorily high performance and just common garden high performance. Mm. There's still going to be a bell curve. Mm. That as it turns out was a particularly important part of the point of the journey because actually it challenged my managers to say well actually in your teams there are people who are performing really well and there are people that you are worried about. Mm. Please tell me the truth mm. and please do the work with people um, that, that are actually not delivering. Mm. Our HR team uh, supports managers in this. Um, I get into trouble with the Commission at regular intervals around my best statistics, um, particularly for HR support. Um, I'm proud that I'm an outlier in the best statistics for HR support mm. because I actually think other agencies and the public service generally underinvests in this area. You cannot expect young managers, you know, who are managing people who are maybe five years younger than them. Um, to actually have the requisite skills to have the difficult performance conversations with people. You just cannot expect that. You've got to support them, you've got to build their skill levels and you can never ever put them in a position where you hang them out to dry. Mm. So we have done um, a lot of really hard work in that area and I think our engagement scores um, really do reflect the fact that that hard work has been done. Your organisation watches you very carefully they watch behaviours carefully. Uh, we give rhetoric around performance and managing non-performers. I know my organisation know who the non-performing people are. Of course they do. They talk about them all the time. Mm. So it's really important to me as the leader of that organisation that it is obvious that those non-performing people are being supported to improve their performance. Mm. Change of tack, culture, organisational culture. You've shifted yours and shifted it markedly with your new strategy. How have you done it in such a way as to still be respectful 
of the past? I have to tell you that's probably the hardest thing to do. Um, my, my natural predisposition um, is, is to be in the future and is to take the, the, the place to where it needs to be. Um, so it's been important to have people on the team who are also respectful of the past. And there have been, over the years in the senior team, which has turned over a little in the last 18 months, but overall, uh, through this period, some of, of probably the most difficult conversations that we've had have been around how we, how we do that. Um, and how we, how we manage to get to the future without always um, having to spend um, an inordinate amount of time in the past. Mm. Paula Rebstock, who was a lead reviewer for our PIF review, said a couple of things uh, to me through the review. And, and one thing she said was, if someone else tells me the story of the journey that you're on, Paul, I'm going to be sick. <laughs> <laughs> and then she says, if anyone else tells me about how nice your organisation is, I will be. <laughs> so she was really, in, 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 in those kind of um, sound bites, uh, you know, seeing, playing out in the review, um, the discourse that was going on inside the organisation and actually the struggle that we've been having with it. I mean, we know from Getting to Great Part One that one of our great challenges as a public service is our tendency to be very effectively reactive to ministers, very responsive, great in the short term, tremendous in a crisis, but perhaps less adept at managing for the long run, mm. at being stewards um, and serving successive governments. Is there something about environment and just the sort of periodicities that you deal with in that, in that organisation that makes you better at stewardship? Because when I read your PIF, stewardship infuses your culture. Mm. How have you managed that? Well, there's a n number of ways. I think you're right. There's a there's a kind of a, a receptivity, all right, to the longer term. Mm. Um, but my place is as driven by the squeaky wheel. You know, ministers are demanding individuals, and inevitably they're squeaky. Um, they've got impossibly short time frames, big agenda to deliver, uh, and no time to sit around wringing their hands. Uh, you know, in the in in the wilderness. So that's always going to be there. But there, there's a number of things um, uh, that I guess have happened. One, one thing actually happened to me, it was uh, I had an opportunity in, in 2010 to, uh, to go uh, to Oxford to do a follow-up to a strategic leadership course that I'd done there 10 years earlier. Um, and this was, it was called Stimulus, it was a, sh a short kind of four day um, engagement. I built my own program and I had two or three individuals that I worked with specifically. One of these individuals had a profound impact on me and on thinking about strategy in the long term. Um, he w had worked for a long time, probably for about 25 years, um, writing and developing and stewarding the strategic plan uh, for one of the world's uh, oldest organisations. He worked for its Secretary of State, his friend Joe Ratzinger, who we mostly know as Benedict XVI. So this guy was responsible for the Vatican's 100-year plan. Wow. Now, that was hugely powerful because I had this conversation with this gentleman about the sorts of issues that, that they were thinking about. Um, and as I had that conversation, I thought to myself, this is exactly the conversation that I should be having with my people back home. So when I came home, I stood up and I started talking to my staff about the 33 governments that we had to think about if we were thinking about interventions to deliver the environment that New Zealanders need to secure their standard of living, their way of life and their sense of place. And that resonated really strongly with my staff, but also because I was able to frame it, if you like, in the, in the context of numbers of governments then allowed me to start a conversation which is more and more rooted in the stewardship domain and in the medium term and is challenging my organisation to think about the long term thinking it needs to do. As a leader who's come on a long personal leadership journey yourself, what advice would you give to our young leaders, people who aspire to be our next generation of chief executives? Uh, there's a very, very simple piece of advice that I, I think I would always give and that is you have got to put people at the centre of everything that you do. If you think you can analyse your way to a solution, you are wrong. If you imagine that you can deliver effective interventions into our communities at the front line uh, without putting your people who are doing those interventions at the heart of your thinking and what you do, 
uh, you are not going to be serving the public of New Zealand. So resolutely, you have got to put people at the centre of what you do. Uh, too often, we don't. And in fact, I think overall the public service doesn't do that. I think it thinks it does that. But if you look at the behaviour of its leaders and the kinds of conversations that are, that are had with its staff, I think you would say room for improvement. So for me, it, it really is. If you, if you are a person who doesn't think people are important uh, to delivering results, I don't think that you can be a senior leader in the New Zealand Public Service. Because there is no problem with the motivation of people in the public service to serve the people of New Zealand. There is no issue there. We have a great public service. What there is, in my view, is an issue about putting people at the heart of the public service so that we are enabling those New Zealanders who wish to serve to actually deliver the results that we all want, we all want to deliver. So measuring it and holding uh, leaders accountable for it and maybe you know, a little bit more accountability around that and a little bit less uh, of a worry um, about the best statistics uh, might, might actually drive a, drive a shift um, in attention. I want to just finish by coming back to you. You lead with a big heart. You let your heart show in what you do to your people. That must take a bit of a toll. How do you maintain your own resilience as a leader over time? Well, what you always have to do is you, you, you have to keep yourself safe. That's a very, very important thing to do. So, I mean, my view is if you're going to lead, you, you've got to be prepared um, to put it out there. Um, because I'm an obligate extrovert, uh, I harvest energy from a room, all right? So for me, there's nothing more enabling um, than speaking to my people and seeing mm. the positive feedback, because that really enables me to, to talk to them. Um, but to be, to be um, authentic, you, you, do have to, you do have to lay it out there. So you've got to keep yourself safe, so that really means that you've got to have the support around you um, to ensure that you, you are. Um, so I have, um, I have a, an executive coach that I've worked with now for six years. When I first went to MFE, we were meeting weekly. Um, now we meet monthly. And that's just an opportunity for me to essentially talk about what the last period has been, the issues that I've been dealing with, how I'm coping with them, uh, and then if I've got some things that I kind of need to unload, I've got that place that I can do some unloading and then get some feedback to actually just help me, um, help me deal with it. Um, and I, of course, have the enduring love um, of the love of my life. <laughs> so. Uh, we talk about my job being our job because that, that's the yeah. way we do it yeah. because um, a very, very important part of my life is that team that I've got at home because mm. uh, I'll frequently come back from a, a hard day at the office, yeah. so to speak, um, and it's the, it, it is, if you like, the skillful, supportive questioning that I get from my partner uh, that really helps me make sense of um, some of the really difficult things that I have actually had to deal with at work. Uh, and it reminds me of why at the end of it all I'm, I'm in this game.